Lord God, bless every person that's hearing this program today. In Jesus' name, you're hearing the program, Gain to Know Jesus. And my name is Harris Kaglidis, and in today's program of Gain to Know Jesus, we will continue studying the Gospel of Mark, where Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 21, it says, Then the multitude came together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread, but when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. The multitude that came was most likely as a result of the disciples preaching miracles and casting out demons. Jesus gave that authority to his disciples. We see that in Mark 3, verse 14 to 15, it says, Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, to have power to heal sickness, and to cast out demons. If Jesus' twelve disciples had power to heal, cast out demons, and preach, how much so would their master, who is Jesus, have power? This would not be the only time where they would not have a moment of peace to eat. We see this and also happening in Mark chapter 6 verse 31. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. Being a minister of the word is not an easy task, as some might think. There are those who makes it look easy because they really don't do anything for the sheep. They don't really study the word and they don't really care for the sheep. To prepare a message to preach any day of the week, sometimes it takes hours of studies, looking at commentaries, Bible dictionaries, Greek and Hebrew lexicons, early church leaders' writings, reformers' writings, reading the scripture in its context, looking for other passages which shed more light on the passage. But there are some times that God does give us a break. A minister has to do house visits. He has to do counseling, and many times while his own house is in the verge of falling apart, he has to pray for the sick or for a brother or sister who have fallen in a sin. Beside, if he has a side job, making sure he completes his hours. I was a pastor for nine years and it was not easy. Sometimes I used to have major migraines in studying. Wanting to keep every member in the church not leaving the church when they get offended. And being persecuted and accused by those who I loved most. Sometimes preaching a message and having my own mother, the one who does the same thing I preached against. Not having time for oneself and feeling most of the time lonely most of the time since it seems that no one understood me. Helping people out of their doubts and while well, myself needing help from my own doubts, which the Lord graciously did help me to find answers. Let's continue this passage. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said he is out of his mind. The word that is used for his own people in the New King James, other translation has it as friends or families. The Greek word is para, which is P-A-R-A. -A. It usually means alongside. I believe it is most likely in reference to his mother, and brothers that we will see later on the chapter trying to stop Jesus from his ministry. In Mark chapter 3 verse 31-35 it says, Then his brothers and his mother came, standing outside. They sent to him, calling him, and a multitude was sitting around him. And they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or bro my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him, and said, Here are my, my mother and my brothers. For whosoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. 
many times it is those who are the closest to you. It could be your mother, your father, friend, brother, sister, son, daughter, wife, or husband. They are your persecutors when you become a Christian or even a minister. Sometimes it could be all except one. Though no one out here understands you, know for sure God is there to hear you when you call on him. Mark chapter 6 states, it very well when it states, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. The one place where you might expect them not to respect you is your own house, family, and friends. While those who are not close to you, they might respect you and even admire you. You could be sure it is not the same at home. Why is that? Maybe God allows it because of pride. We seem to become prideful when everyone seems to look up to us and nothing goes wrong. And what better way to keep us in check when in private, God allows it not to be so at home. If this is not the case with you and everyone thinks well of you, don't feel prideful. That is the way the false prophets were treated. And it might be a sign you are one. Luke 6 verse 26. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Don't look to be hated or persecuted. But expect it if you are trying to live a godly life. 2 Timothy 3.12 says. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. To finish, there is a passage in Ezekiel which I love to read sometimes. It is found in Ezekiel 3 and it talks about the topic we are talking about today. Ezekiel 3 verses 4-7 says, Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language but to the house of Israel not to many people of unfamiliar speech and hard language whose words you cannot understand surely had I sent you to them they would have listened to you but the house of Israel would not listen to you because they will not listen to me for all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted this we see the case with Jonah, where he preached to Nineveh, and the whole people of that nation got saved. But I often imagine if he would bring the same message to his own people, how many would he bring to repentance? I imagine very few and maybe none. I am not trying to discourage anyone from praying for, for their family members for salvation, because many times God answers those prayers, but that that would not still make you number one to be admired by them because they see your faults and many times we need to be told our own faults because again because of pride pride is so easy to rise up from our fallen nature god bless you and i'll see you next program of gain to know jesus bye if you enjoy this program feel free to make a copy and give it to a friend and that way, they will get to know Jesus as well. Bye. Glory to God. Bless every person that is hearing this program today. In Jesus' name, you are hearing the program, Gain to Know Jesus. And my name is Harris Kakalidis. And in today's program of Gain to Know Jesus, we will continue studying the Gospel of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. And it says, Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said he is out of his mind. As I spoke in our last program about why many times as Christians we receive persecution by those we love, we cannot speak in the same sense in respect concerning Jesus. For Jesus, as I said it 
in other programs is sinless. Jesus is the light, and the whole world is in darkness. And darkness does not love the light. It can never seem to figure it out. Though we could imagine Mary to understand Jesus and even tell his brothers and sisters, your brother is God the Son. I had him by a virgin birth. He is sinless. But that seems not to be the case. Mary did not understand Jesus. She did not understand him in Luke chapter 2. And she does not understand him when he's already grown up. Maybe at times she forgot who she was dealing with. God as man. It is so easy to see someone growing up and now when they are older to think of them in the same sense. Sometimes it is like that with pastors or even the president. Could you imagine how the president's mom would speak to him if she was alive? Would she call him Mr. President or would she call him by a nickname she had for him as a child? Most likely she will slip and call him by that nickname in public. Who knows? Jesus' close family members thought he was crazy. I remember when I spoke about the Bible to my aunt. She told me, don't read that book. It would make you turn crazy. At that time, I thought about what Festus told Paul and Paul's response in Acts chapter 26, verse 24-25, which I read to her, even though she didn't want to hear it. It says, Now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. In Jesus' case, he does not just speak the words of truth and reason, but he is the very truth itself. And everything he does has a reason. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus himself was the very truth. So let's continue with Mark 3, verse 22. It says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Bezalel, and by the ruler of demons he cast out devils. Well, Jesus' family thought that Jesus was crazy. Jesus' enemies said worse. They said he has a demon. If you ever felt misunderstood, Jesus, while on earth, was the most misunderstood person that ever lived. Even today, there are people from all kinds of religion saying Jesus never claimed to be God, while anyone who is saved could find more than a thousand verses of Jesus doing something or saying things that only God could do and has the right to say. The scribes and the Pharisees started to accuse Jesus of having a demon when Jesus healed a man who was blind and mute. This is Matthew 12, verse 22-24, it says. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and the mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Bezebub, the ruler of the demons. None of them ever thought that Jesus was fulfilling prophecy, that when the Messiah will come, these are the very things he would do. Isaiah 29 verse 18 says, in that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. That's Isaiah 29, 18. Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. 
Isaiah 42 verse 7 says to open uh, blind eyes to bring out prisoners from the prison those who sit in darkness from the prison house Isaiah 42 18 says hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see God told Moses the following in Exodus 4 11 when Moses started making excuses why he couldn't go to Pharaoh God said this so the Lord said to him who has made man's mouth or who makes the mute the deaf the seeing or the blind have not I the Lord so in Jesus healing this man who could not see and was mute, what was he doing <clears throat> Jesus was doing two things he was showing himself to be God and he was showing himself to be the Messiah all at once but the scribes are having a hard time to understand this, the scribes and the Pharisees. In matter of fact, after this miracle, the Pharisees and the scribes will go on to ask Jesus to perform a other miracle to show them that he is the Messiah, like the first one did not show enough evidence to prove that. If anyone would read those passages and then see the miracle done by Jesus, they will conclude he is the Messiah. He is fulfilling prophecy as we know it. But yet they did not understand that. They were completely blind spiritually. Matthew 12 verse 38 says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, Teacher, you want to see a sign from you. Did, did they not see the first miracle? He cured a man that was blind and was dumb. He could not speak. <clears throat> That's fulfilled prophecy. But yet, they will ask for a sign. That was enough sign to convince anyone. But yet, since they're spiritually discerned, they will not be convinced. This reminds me of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greek seeks after wisdom. How much signs does an unbeliever have to see to believe? He can see miracles from birth till the grave. And he still will not believe till God changes his heart. Till he turns that heart of stone and makes it a heart of flesh. Till that happens, he will not believe. Man needs to be born again, or better said, born from above. The Holy Spirit needs to do something to man. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, create in us a heart to believe more in the Lord Jesus Christ and live for his glory. We worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the great work you are doing in our lives. Whether we see it or not, for we live by faith and not by sight. Amen. God bless you, and I'll see you next program of Getting to Know Jesus. Bye. If you enjoy this program, feel free to make a copy and give it to a friend. And that way, they will get to know Jesus as well. Lord God, bless every person that's hearing this program today. In Jesus' name, you're hearing the program, Gain to Know Jesus. And my name is Harris Kaklidis. And in today's program of Gain to Know Jesus, we will continue studying the Gospel of Mark. In today's program, we will talk about the unforgivable sin. There is a sin among all sins that has no forgiveness. And that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Let's read the passages that speak clearly about this. We read in Mark chapter 3 verse 22 to 30 and it says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. So he called them to himself and said to them, In parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. And then he will plunder his house. Or surely I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, 
and whatever blasphemies they may alter. But he who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to internal condemnation, because they said he has an unclean spirit. The ASV, NIV, um, New American Standard Version says, but is guilty of an internal sin. The King James says, but is in danger of internal damnation. Let's go on to Matthew, and it says in Matthew 12, verse 31 to 32, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Nor is what it states, the one who commits this sin is not ever forgiven, whether in this world or the one to come. Remember, this world will have an end, and according to the Bible, we expect a new heavens, new earth, Revelation 21.1. Now I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Let's read Luke's gospel now about this subject. It says in Luke 12, verse 10, And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. In the scribes and Pharisees saying that Jesus did his miracles by the prince of the demons, they were saying that the Holy Spirit was a demon, since it was the Holy Spirit that these miracles was brought forth by. Matthew 12 verse 28 says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke 11 verse 20 says but if I cast out demons with the finger of God surely the kingdom of God has come upon you there are many Christians who at times get scared that they might have committed this act hopefully in this program you will find some relief in your heart that you haven't committed this sin we're going to mention some things which a person who commits this sin should act so if you don't act according to this way you are innocent of this awful sin now let's speak about what should be expected of a person who has committed this sin we have to remember that such a person is empty of spirituality even if they look spiritual outwardly they don't carry the holy spirit with them so we should not see the Holy Spirit active in their lives. Number one, a cold heart towards God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No interest in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who puts love for God in the believer. Romans 5 verse 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts. We have love for God because we have the Holy Spirit. We have love for Jesus. We have love for the Father, for the Holy Spirit. There is a love for God in us. Number two, a heart of unbelief. Doesn't matter how many evidence you see in favor of Jesus, you will still not believe in him. You will ask for more signs. Matthew twelve thirty eight. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Matthew 16, verse 1, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. Mark 8, verse 11 says, Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. The Holy Spirit is the one who works faith in the believer to believe Galatians 5 verse 22 23 in the young version it says and the fruit of the Spirit is faith 
You see, it doesn't matter how many miracles Jesus could do in front of the Pharisees and scribes, they won't believe. <clears throat> it doesn't matter how many evidence you show an unbeliever who, ha who has committed this very sin, they will not believe. It's impossible for them to believe because it's the Holy Spirit who works faith in them, in, in the believer to believe. Hostility towards Jesus. That's one thing that you would see if a person commits this sin. If Jesus would be here at this moment in the flesh, you would be plotting to kill him or better yet, attempting to kill him. Matthew twelve fourteen. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Mark 3, verse 6. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Hedorians against him how they might destroy him. Number four, no repentance towards your sin. You would do it again and again and feel like it wasn't sin. The Holy Spirit gives the believer repentance towards their sin. John 16, verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Number five, you would not be worried about at all if you commit this sin. Those who commit this sin are not worried about if they commit this sin or not. <clears throat> Notice the way the William translation states it. For he gets it right, according to the Greek, the word said in, in Mark 3 verse 30 is in the imperfect tense in the Greek. So it should be translated, kept saying or persisted in saying. That is why... It should be translated that way. In Mark 3 verse 30 it says, He said so because they kept saying he is under the spell of a foul spirit. Not that they said it once, but they kept on saying it without no need of repentance about that sin. They didn't feel bad. They, they kept on committing. They just kept on saying it. So if you feel worried about that you committed this sin, you most likely did not commit this sin. But who knows how many times God has saved us from this very act when we were very close to committing this sin. So we have to guard our mouths. God bless you and I'll see you next program of Getting to Know Jesus. If you enjoy this program, feel free to make a copy and give it to a friend. And that way they will get to know Jesus as well. Bye. Lord God, bless every person that is hearing this program today. In Jesus' name, you are hearing the program, Gain to Know Jesus. And my name is Harris Kakalides. And in today's program of Gain to Know Jesus, we'll be studying the Gospel of Mark. I desire to start a series on the person of the Holy Spirit. For I believe in many ways he of all the persons of the Godhead is the most rejected one even among God's own people. He is either not spoken about or if he is spoken about, he is not honored as God even though people will acknowledge him as the giver of the spiritual gifts and the fruit of the Spirit. As we started talking about him last week about the blasphemy of the Spirit, it is important for us to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is a person. Many cults deny the personality of the Spirit. To name a few, there, there are the Jehovah Witnesses who treat the Holy Spirit as an active force and not a person or God. There are also the Christophenians who also deny the personality of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit to them is only God's inter instrumental power, but He's not God, and He's not a person. Now, to do what I'm intending to do, we have to find out what is a person. You might say, well, a person is one who has personality. Now, what is personality? Random House Webster Dictionary states, under personality, the visible aspect of one's character as it impresses others. Number two, 
A person as an embodiment of a collection of qualities. Number three, the sum total of the physical, mental, emotional, and social characteristic of an individual. Let's go there. Let's grab number three, which states physical, mental, emotional, and social. Those are four qualities of a person. Now, does the Holy Spirit contain physical? Can the Holy Spirit be felt as one feels another individual? Number two, mental. Can the Holy Spirit think and has a mind of his own? Number three, emotional. Does the Holy Spirit has emotions like being happy, sad, angry, and so forth? Number four, social. Can the Holy Spirit communicate with others? I will try to answer each of these by the scripture and not by personal experience because I could tell you my personal experience and it may be true for me but it may not be true for you and it, it there's no real good evidence for personal experience all the time I'm not saying that you can't use your conversion experience to convert someone to Christ but what I am saying that we need an authority outside of our personal experience because my personal experience may not line up with the scripture I want to have a judge of what I'm telling you to be true or not and that judge is the scripture itself now let's look at as physical has anyone in the scripture ever said to feel the Holy Spirit judges 15 14 says then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him upon Samson <clears throat> did you notice the phrase that the Spirit came mildly upon him. Can mildly be felt or is a phrase with no meaning that the author wrote down to sound impressive? In Mark 1 verse 10 says, Immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him, upon Jesus, like a dove. In Acts 2 verse 1 to 4 says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where there were sitting. Then there appeared to them dividing tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them alterance. Acts 8 verse 17 says, Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 10 verse 44 to 47 says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit as we have? Now, here in this passage of Scripture, we see the Holy Spirit being, as it were, received as one would receive another person. But you might ask, was it felt? It must, be, it must have been felt, for it had effects. It, could, it caused those who received it to speak in tongues. We know that a spirit does not have flesh and bones. Jesus said it. Luke 24 verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. 
Does one have to have flesh and bones to be a person? Could a spirit be a person? Does one have to feel a spirit as one feels a person with flesh and bone to be a person? Angels are spirits. And many would not think twice of calling them persons. Hebrews 1, 13 to 14 says, But to which of the angels has he ever said, God the Father have ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to, for those who will inherit salvation? Angels are spirits, but they cannot be denied that they are persons. God the Father is said to be a spirit, and it is never argued that he's not a, a person. Matthew 16, verse 17 says, Jesus answered and said to him, to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. John 4, verse 23 to 24 says, But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So is the Father a person? Yes. There's no denying the fact that the Father has personality. That he is a person. But can you feel the Father as you feel another person? No, we can't feel the Father. <clears throat> He's enthroned above. Demons are spirits. Are demons considered persons? Many will not find a verse which say they are, but it will not be denied they are. <clears throat> Do you consider your soul a person? Your soul is not your spirit because a spirit is different from the soul. But a soul is very much spiritual, but it is not denied that it is a person. For your soul is you. Can one feel the Father? Or has one ever felt an angel, a demon, or a soul? And do they feel as a person with flesh and blood? No, they feel different. They must feel different. But they cannot be denied of being a person. Why can every spirit be a person but the Holy Spirit? Why is he, being a spirit, cannot be a person? Yet every spirit could be a person. If it is concluded that all spirits are persons, at least all those in that category, by this argument, why should we exclude the Holy Spirit from being a person? The Holy Spirit is said to fill, Acts 4 verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Then Peter, being filled by the Spirit, caused in him boldness. Before this, he was scared to confess his faith in Jesus to a girl in the Gospels. Now he is confessing his faith to groups of 3,000 in the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and 5,000 in another chapter. Acts 4 verse 31 says that when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Notice the effects of the things around them. The place where they were assembled together was shaken. Can shaken be felt? For that was a feeling they felt before the Holy Spirit filled them. The feeling of having the Spirit is not described per se, but the effects are described. Have you ever felt a person shake a place by their stomping or jumping around? Well, it's just like that when the Spirit is around at times. Acts 9, 17 says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, on Paul, he said to him, Brother Saul, 
the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That word filled in the Greek could also be translated controlled by the Spirit. Acts 13.9 Then Saul who also is called Paul filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 13.52 says and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Ephesians 5 verse 18 says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dispensation, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, be controlled by the Spirit. Let the Spirit control you. Now, if something or someone controls you, has authority over you, could that something be a person? And I say yes, because the Holy Spirit is a person, and He is God, as we're going to see in these studies. Can one feel when they are filled, and when they are empty of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit? Psalms 51 verse 11 says, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Could David feel a difference in his life with the Spirit as without him? I believe so. I believe there was a difference. Bible he then asked for him not to leave him. If there was not a difference whether he was with him or without him. So if they can feel the difference of the Holy Spirit being with them and in them and being separate from them can we say that the Holy Spirit is not a person that he he can be felt when he is around and when he's not he could also be felt as one feels a person's presence when they are around you and when they are gone Stephen said about the Holy Spirit to his accusers you stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Can someone or something that is resisted be felt? And my answer is yes. Everything that has an effect can be felt in one way or another. And what we see the Holy Spirit from Scripture has an effect when He is around. He could be resisted because he lets people resist him. But he could be controlling because he does control people. Look at what the Jesus states concerning the Holy Spirit. In John 7 verse 38 to 39 it says, He who believes in me as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. But the Holy Spirit is described in Scripture as rivers of water, wind, oil, fire, a dove. All these things can be felt, why not Him? If the things that describe Him or symbolize Him could be felt, how much more is the real thing? Or better said, the real person. We will cover the next topic. Can the Holy Spirit think and has a mind of his own in our next program? As we continue studying the personality of the Holy Spirit, then we will look at his Godhead and we will continue the Gospel of Mark because I feel it's very important for us to study his person. It's important for us to study his Godhood because we're talking about him in the Gospels and we need to know him just as we need to know the Father as well God bless you and I'll see you in the next program of Gains Know Jesus if you enjoy this program feel free to make a copy and give it to a friend and that way they will get to know Jesus as well bye Lord God bless every person that's hearing this program today in Jesus name here in the program, Gain to Know Jesus. And my name is Harris Kaglidis.
In today's program of Getting to Know Jesus, we will continue studying the Gospel of Mark. We studied in our last program about the Holy Spirit being felt as a person. In today's program, I will talk about the Holy Spirit having a mind of his own and being able to think and use that mind as a person does. If he has a mind of his own, he also has his own will, a purpose for the things he does. Let's look at some verses on this subject. Romans 8 verse 26-27 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be altered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Notice the passage that we just read, which tells us about the Holy Spirit interceding for us, and it also talks about the mind of the Holy Spirit. It only makes common sense. If he, the Holy Spirit, intercedes for you, he also must have a mind to think. A computer cannot intercede for you. A computer does not have a mind. It has a memory drive, but it cannot think on its own. We also see here a little bit about emotion, which we will cover in our next program. But emotions shows a mind. Only a living animal or person who thinks can show emotion. When we think about things in our past or present, we show emotion because it makes us feel a certain way. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11 to 12, it says, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, and we, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Here we see that the Holy Spirit has asked us to the mind of God and can show us what God demands from us. But notice the way the verse says it. It says, No man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him. It's comparing the Holy Spirit to a man. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. It's, it's an amazing verse. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 11 says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of of healings by the same spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits to another different kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues but one and the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills notice the verse just read the Holy Spirit, since he could think of his own, can also do things according to his will. He gives the spiritual gifts according to his wills, not ours. The verse says, distributing to each one individually as he wills, as the Holy Spirit wills. In our next program, we will look at the emotion of the Holy Spirit showing his personality by his emotions. What does that mean? It means that the Holy Spirit could feel happy, sad, and angry, and so forth. God bless you, and I'll see you next program of Gain to Know Jesus. If you enjoy this program, feel free to make a copy and give it to a friend, and that way they will get to know Jesus as well. Bye. Lord God, bless every person that is hearing this program today. In Jesus' name. Hearing the program, Gain to Know Jesus.
and my name is Harris Kakalides and in today's program of Gain to Know Jesus we will continue studying the Gospel of Mark. We studied in our last program about the Holy Spirit having a mind and of his own being able to think and use that mind as he will just like a person because he is a person. In today's program we will look at the Holy Spirit as emotional as well. That means that the Holy Spirit can feel happy, sad, and angry. These are qualities of a person. The Holy Spirit can feel sad or angry. In Isaiah 63 verse 10 it says, But they rebelled, talking about Israel, and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. The word for grieved in the Hebrew could also mean in this passage to hurt, pain, grieve, displease, vexed. There are some Spanish Bibles who translate it angry. They made the Holy Spirit angry and they grieved him. They caused him pain because Israel made him feel this way. Notice how he responds. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them. Here the Holy Spirit made himself the enemy of the people of Israel because they caused the Holy Spirit to feel sad or angry. Ephesians 4 verse 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How many times have we Christians grieved the Holy Spirit by our conduct? In our last program, we looked at Romans 8.27. The fact that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be altered. Groanings suggest emotion. You can only groan if you have some kind of feelings. The Holy Spirit can also feel love. Romans 15 verse 30 says, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Love is something very common among us humans. And this is, and in this verse, it speaks clearly of the Holy Spirit having love. We can look at the fruits of the Spirit and we can see the qualities he has as only a person could have. Galatians 5 verse 22 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Look at that, that word, long-suffering or patience. Some translation says patience. But long-suffering, you can only suffer if you are a person. If you're not a person, or a living being, you cannot suffer. If we are lacking anything of these, the Holy Spirit is lacking none. I believe He, the Holy Spirit, is more of a person than you and I could ever be. For He always was a person as God is a person. And could show us and make us be the person God wants us to be. I'll see you in the next program of Getting to Know Jesus where we'll be studying about that the Holy Spirit could communicate. God bless you. Bye. If you enjoy this program, feel free to make a copy and give it to a friend. And that way they will get to know Jesus as well. Bye. Lord God, bless every person that's hearing this program today. In Jesus' name. Hearing the program, Gain to Know Jesus. And my name is Harris Kakalides. And in today's program of Gain to Know Jesus, we will continue studying the Gospel of Mark. We have been already studying the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person, and as a person can be felt, he has a mind of his own, and he's able to think and use that mind as he wills, and that he is emotional, but he has feelings. In today's program, we will look at the Holy Spirit is social. That means he can and does communicate with others. 
2 Corinthians 13, 14 is a great verse to start this program. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. That's the way New King James says. The New American Standard Version says, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Um, notice that the fellowship, the communion, this is communication. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit can make demands. He could command. Acts 8 verse 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. In Acts 13 verse 2 and 4 says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed, and laid hands on them they sent them away so being sent out by the Holy Spirit they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus <clears throat> the Bible also teaches that the, that he the Holy Spirit that commands can also forbid notice how the Holy Spirit forbids Paul and his companions from going to certain places in the following passage. Acts 16, verse 6 and 8, it says, Now when they had gone through Perfigia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to choice. <laughs> the fact that the Holy Spirit can command and can forbid, <clears throat> those are characteristic as a person. The Holy Spirit can also teach and bring things to remembrance. John 14 verse 26 it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 13 says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The Holy Spirit is also a leader, and he also leads the people of God. Romans 8 verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Let's just say a few more things about the Holy Spirit before we finish in today's program. The Holy Spirit testifies, John 15, verse 26. The Holy Spirit contends, Genesis 6, verse 3. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us with the Father, Romans 8, 26. The Holy Spirit could be lied to, Acts 5, verse 3. The Holy Spirit could be insulted, Hebrews 10, 29. He could also be resisted, Acts 7, verse 51. The Holy Spirit could also be blasphemed against, Matthew 12, verse 31. All these are characteristics of a person. These are all qualities a person has in communicating with others and others with him or her, which the Holy Spirit himself as a person does as well. In our next program, we will seek to answer the verses which describes the Holy Spirit unlike a person, like to fill and being poured out. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next program of Getting to Know Jesus. Bye. If you enjoy this program, feel free to make a copy and give it to a friend, and that way they will get to know Jesus as well. Bye. Glory God, bless every person that is hearing this program today. Jesus thing you're hearing the program gain to know Jesus and my name is Harris Kekulides and in today's program of gain to know Jesus we will continue studying the gospel mark in today's program where we, we seek to answer verses which describes the Holy Spirit unlike a person any person you may know verses which talks about the Holy Spirit being poured out and filling the believer in Jesus Christ <clears throat> let's look at 
the expression being poured out. In Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 29, it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, I would like to show some verses where humans are said to be poured out. Because this is a figure of speech. There are examples of this in the Psalms. An example of this is used by humans mentioned in the following Psalm. In Psalms 42, we see the psalmist pouring his soul to God. <clears throat> Psalms 42 verse 9 it says, when I remember these things, I poured out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. The soul of a person is the actual person. Did the author had his soul in a cup and then poured it out? No, it is a figure of speech. Psalm 62, we see the psalmist telling us to pour our hearts to the Lord. Psalm 62 verse 8 says, Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. See that? Do we have our hearts in a cup or a bowl to pour it out when we want to? No. We also see this expression in the New Testament in reference to others besides the Holy Spirit. Look at what Paul states about himself before his death. We see that in Philippians 2.17. <clears throat> yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. 2 Timothy 4, 6 also says this and says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I am being poured out. I am already being poured out. Collins Cole Bill English Dictionary states about this expression the following, If you poured out your thoughts, feelings, or expressions, you tell someone all about them. I pour out my thoughts out on paper in an attempt to rationalize my feelings. Close quote. Even though much more could be said about this expression, we will go to another one. The other expression is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Acts 2 verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts 4 verse 8 Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them rulers of the people and elders of Israel When answering this we have to keep in mind the following Number 1 God is spirit you can see that in John 4 Jesus says God is spirit Number 2 God's body is not like ours for example we are limited he is not limited he could be in more places than one Number three, we can never in this life fully understand God. Isaiah 55 verse 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord of hosts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Number four, God can do the impossible. That's very important to note. God can do the impossible. <clears throat> Mark's chapter 10 verse 27 says, But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Number five, God does fill heaven and earth. Why not people like you and me if we are believers in his son Jesus Christ? Jeremiah 23 verse 24 says, Can anyone hide himself in secret places 
so I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? <clears throat> if anything, the fact that the Holy Spirit could fill a believer shows his godhood. Because only God could fill heaven and earth, so he could also fill believers. Number six, Jesus, while on earth, spoke some heavy spiritual truths, which people in his time or in ours do not fully understand. Like in John 6, where he tells us to eat his flesh and drink his blood to have eternal life. Does this make Jesus less of a person because he speaks of himself as a drink and food? No, it does not. So it shouldn't make the Holy Spirit less of a person if the Bible tells us things about him that at times we could not fully understand. Number seven, the word filled also means control. That is what we Christians are called to be controlled by the Spirit and not to walk according to our carnal desires and nature. In our next program, we will focus more about the deity of the Holy Spirit. By deity, I mean that the Holy Spirit is God. In a later program, we might take a glimpse of the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is three in one, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we will go back to the studies of, of, of Mark. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next program of Getting to Know Jesus. If you enjoy this program, feel free to make a copy and give it to a friend. And that way, they will get to know Jesus as well. Bye. Lord God, bless every person that is hearing this program today. In Jesus' name, you are hearing the program, Gain to Know Jesus. And my name is Harris Kakalides. And in today's program of Gain to Know Jesus, we'll continue studying Actually, we're still in the Gospel of Mark, but we're, we took time off to study uh, the topic about the Holy Spirit, the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person. And in today's topic, we'll see that the Holy Spirit is God. Number one is that the Holy Spirit is clearly called God in Scripture. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4 says, But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remaineth, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Who did Ananias lie to? He lied to the Holy Spirit. And who is the Holy Spirit? God himself. Notice that phrase, you have not lied to men, but to God. Lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God. Besides the fact, we see here the Holy Spirit as a person, since you cannot lie to an active force, as the Jehovah Witnesses call the Holy Spirit. Here is a perfect evidence of the Holy Spirit being God. The next passage we're going to look at is 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. We're going to compare it to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 first Corinthians 3 verse 16 and 17 says do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you if anyone defiles the temple of God God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy which temple you are no it's the temple of God your body is the temple of God in first Corinthians 6 19 it says or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So notice, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says that your body is the temple of God. But 1 Corinthians 6, 19 tells us that, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. What we are doing here is comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, scripture with scripture. And it leads us to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit is God. Notice the passages which we was which was read, First Corinthians three sixteen and seventeen. We are told that our bodies are the temple of God, and in First Corinthians six nineteen, we're told that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Either this is a contradiction, or 
or these passages are clearly telling us that the Holy Spirit and God is one and the same in reference. Now, let's look at a passage in the New Testament when compared to the Old Testament clearly shows the Holy Spirit to be God. Though there are many more passages like this which shows this to be true. I decided to, due to time to, to just show this one in Acts chapter 28 verse 25 27 says so when they did not agree among themselves they departed after Paul had said one word the Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers saying go to this people and say hearing you will hear and not understand and seeing you will see and not perceive for the hearts of this people have grown dull and their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them <clears throat> let's compare this to the Old Testament which the prophecy says in Isaiah 6 verse 8 to 10 it says this also I heard the voice of the Lord notice the Lord Jehovah saying whom shall I send and whom will go for us then I said here am I send me and he said go and tell this people keep on hearing but do not understand keep on seeing but do not perceive make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed notice who said it in Acts it was the Holy Spirit who said this but who says in the Old Testament it was God it was the voice of the Lord it was God himself these these passages when compared to each other shows clearly again that the God and the Holy Spirit is one and the same before we finish I would like to let you know that God is three in one there is the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit each one is God but they are separate from each other there is no perfect illustration one can give to show this clearly but I could say this, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. The Father is not the Son, or the Holy Spirit is But yet, they are God. Those three are the God of the Bible. Some illustrations, though not perfect, one could give is the church. There are many members in the church, but only one church. Marriage, there is two, yet one. Light, there are three colors that make up light. Red, yellow, and blue. Yet light is one. God bless you and I'll see you next program of Gain to Know Jesus. Where we'll start again talking about the Gospel of Mark. Bye. If you enjoy this program, feel free to make a copy and give it to a friend. And that way they will get to know Jesus as well. Bye.